All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We're going to get started in just a moment, but um, a few details before we get underway. Um, we are recording today's event, and the video will be posted on the Basic Science website in a couple of weeks, so we will be able to share those with uh, alumni and friends who couldn't join us today, or if you would like to view the talks again, they'll be available. You can also view the videos from past events um, from previous seasons as well. Due to the large number of attendees, we are going to keep the audience muted, but we do want to hear from you. So if you have questions for any of our panelists, please post them in the chat and we will try to get to as many of your questions as we can. And uh, with that, I am pleased to introduce the Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences, Steve Kahn. Uh, thank you, Susan. Good evening and uh, welcome to Basic Science Lights the Way. I'm Steve Kahn. As Susan mentioned, I'm the Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences, and I'm delighted to be here this evening, which is our first uh, BSLTW uh, event for the spring semester of 2023. Uh, this series cuts to the core of who we are and what we believe at Berkeley. Life-changing discoveries depend on the open-ended pursuit of our researchers' curiosity. Uh, tonight, we're going to focus on the new faculty experience. It's been said that teaching is the greatest act of optimism, and our new faculty members are the epitome of that hope. They arrive at Berkeley with new ideas, fresh approaches, and a rejuvenating energy. Some of them actually aren't very far removed from their own graduate studies, which allows them to better understand the needs of the students that we serve. Uh, each of our, our stellar panelists tonight represents the future of their field. We're going to hear from some of the college's newest faculty members about their experiences establishing new labs, teaching courses, and conducting research here in the College of Letters and Science. And as you may guess, Settling into Berkeley is not the easiest thing, particularly for experimentalists. They have to establish residence, set up a laboratory, get equipment, and start in on teaching big classes. So it's a challenge, and all of them have uh, risen to the occasion. Uh, once we're underway, I hope you will post your questions for any of our speakers in the chat box. We will answer as many of them as we can. Um, let me introduce our moderator for this evening. Uh, she is Professor Rebecca Heald, a professor of cell biology, development, and physiology, and co-chair of the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology. Rebecca studies extracts from frog eggs to understand the intricate me mechanics behind cell division and the factors that control, control cell growth with important ramifications for public health including cancer research. Rebecca is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and was elected last month to fellowship in the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Aside from her research, her overarching professional goal is to provide a productive and nurturing environment for young ac academics, guiding them to the next phase of their careers. Uh, Heald Lab alums have gone on to work for dozens of prestigious companies and universities. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Rebecca. Take it away. Thank you, Steve. I'm excited to host tonight's event. I think everyone will be really impressed by the dedication, creativity, and most importantly, by the curiosity that drives these scientists. Our focus this evening is on the experience of some of our newest faculty members. Transitioning from being a postdoctoral research to, researcher to a faculty member is a major step for academics. The challenges faced by new faculty can be multidimensional, encompassing topics such as identity development, institutional support, student engagement, mentoring and networking, and of course, tenure and promotion stress. But new faculty members also have many opportunities to significantly significantly impact their students and their academic fields. It's quite a delicate balance to negotiate, and I'm really interested to hear from our new faculty about their research and experiences. Uh, so at the end of each talk, um, we'll have three talks, we will try to address all the questions from the audience. So please add your questions in the chat. And our first speaker is Penny Weiser. 
Um, okay, so Penny Weiser is an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science at Berkeley. Penny joined our faculty this past July and has since been working to establish the Volcanology and Igneous Petrology Lab at Berkeley, also known as the VIBE Lab. She's an igne igneous petrologist and volcanologist using erupted melts, crystals, gases, and volcanic aerosols to understand volcanic systems. Her research interests are very broad, span spanning mantle melting, storage and transport of magmas in the crust, controls on eruption style, and the release of volatile elements into the atmosphere. Over to you, Penny. Awesome. Okay, so my group really researches the processes that occur in the Earth's crust in the lead up to volcanic eruptions. And our motivation is really to understand these systems well enough that we can help volcano observatories and government agencies make informed decisions during times of volcanic crisis. We can't stop volcanoes erupting. What we can do is make sure that people are evacuated and aircraft aren't in the sky when that eruption starts. And also keep those people out the way as the eruption evolves over weeks, months, or even years. So one of the key parameters to really understand eruptions and why they start is the depth at which the magma was stored. So for example, beneath Mount St. Helens or beneath the 2018 eruption of Kilauea. We want to know, was that magma at one kilometer's depth before it erupted, or was it at five, 10, or 50 kilometers depth? Why do we care about this parameter? Firstly, if we want to build quantitative models of eruption triggering at a given volcano, this is one of the most important parameters to build into that model. The second reason is to interpret signals of unrest at these volcanoes. So you have a given volcano, say my group have worked on it, and we've worked out that magma is stored at about 10 kilometers depth from looking at the erupted rocks. Now let's say earthquakes start at this volcano, and obviously the community living around are going to be very concerned. They want to know, do these earthquakes mean an eruption is going to happen soon? And comparing it to magma storage depths really helps us answer those questions. If the earthquakes are much shallower than where we think magma was stored in past eruptions, it probably doesn't mean an eruption is going to happen. It's probably the hydrothermal system, so motion of fluids in the upper crust. And you'll see all those Yellowstone things like, we're all going to die, Yellowstone's erupting. It's mostly these hydrothermal earthquakes, so they are not really a concern. But if we start seeing earthquakes clustering around the same depth where we think the magma is stored, this is much more concerning. This new, means new magma is coming into that reservoir, and if you have a set volume and you add more liquid to it, the pressure will keep increasing, and eventually that will fracture and an eruption will happen. So seeing these signals, this is the point at which the volcano observatories would maybe start issuing evacuation orders. But we need to get this right. We can't just issue an evacuation order every time earthquakes happen. Because if you ask people to evacuate and then an eruption doesn't happen, you're basically crying wolf. They will not evacuate the second time around. So we really need to make sure we can interpret these signals of unrest through knowing about the magma system before any activity even starts at that volcano. So how do we do this? We go to volcanoes and we collect samples from many, many, many past eruptions. And from these rock samples, we crush them up and we extract crystals. And inside these crystals, these are a few millimeters in size, are tiny pockets of bubbles. These were trapped as the crystals were growing from the magma. And these are about one to two microns in size. So they're very, very small bubbles. And it turns out these bubbles in many volcanoes are mostly CO2. And that is great because if we can measure the density of CO2, then we can calculate a pressure at which that pocket of gas was trapped in the crystal. And we do this using an equation of state for CO2 gas. And if we know the pressure and we know how dense the Earth's crust is, we can work out how deep that crystal had to be buried when it trapped that little bubble and if we do this lots and lots of times, we can basically work out where magma was being stored in the crust when those crystals were growing. So what does this look like? I can measure hundreds of these bubbles from a given volcano. This was Kilauea volcano. And we see a cluster at about one to two kilometers depth and three to five kilometers depth. 
So now what we know is that beneath this volcano, we have two distinct magma reservoirs that are feeding those eruptions. So now we know the depth of the crust at which if we see earthquakes, we're probably going to be concerned that an eruption might be happening in the next few weeks or months. How do we actually do this? So I said we need to know the density of CO2 gas in these tiny bubbles. And we use a technique called Raman spectroscopy. And this is my Raman spectrometer. So you have a green laser and you shine it down a high powered microscope and you focus it on these tiny bubbles. And a small amount of that light is scattered back by a process called Raman scattering. And we can collect that on our spectrometer and you get these two very distinct peaks. This is the signature of CO2 gas. What we know is that as CO2 gas gets denser, the peaks move apart. So what this means is if we can measure the distance between the peaks, we can work out the CO2 density. Now we need to calibrate that relationship and we do this experimentally. So my postdoc during her PhD designed this amazing setup that she is recreating here at Berkeley. So you take super pure CO2 gas in a gas tank and then you pressurize it by hand by winding this cylinder in. And you're basically forcing CO2 gas into this little cell. And this has a see-through sapphire window on top of it. So you can shine the laser into the CO2 gas and we are measuring the temperature and the pressure in this cell. And that means we can calculate the density of CO2. So we basically collect spectra at lots of different densities. And that means for our specific instrument, we know how far apart the peaks and what density that corresponds to. So this should be easy to set up. Charlotte already designed this. How does this work in reality? So we tweaked the design from about July to September. We were trying to get it to about twice the pressure that her previous cell could do so that we could look at even deeper magma storage. We then ordered the parts in September and they're all custom made. So it takes about three months. They were supposed to arrive on December 1st. As many of you know, we had a major strike at Berkeley. So no deliveries came until mid-January. The cell then arrives and we have to screw it all together, all of the different components. And it always wants to leak. Every single one of these joins will leak CO2 gas unless we get it perfectly tightened up. If you think about your bike tire, our apparatus is about 300 times more pressure than a bike tire. So it's really high pressure. It really wants to leak. So we leak test it in water, and then we have to use various leak testing solutions to find all the really tiny leaks. So we've assembled this cell, we've managed to get rid of all the leaks. And then the final thing we had to do was get the thermistor in. So this actually measures the temperature inside the cell. The cell was designed with an eighth of an inch entrance and we bought an eighth of an inch thermistor. This should fit perfectly. And the one Charlotte bought at Cornell, we ordered exactly the same one. It arrived and it wouldn't fit at all in the cell. So we measured it and it turns out it was about 11% larger than it should have been, 11% larger than the one at Cornell. So we phoned up the manufacturer and said, hey, it doesn't fit. And they were like, oh, you just got unlucky, order another one. So we ordered another one and it also didn't fit. And then we ordered another one and it still didn't fit. So at which point we said to the company, what's going on? Like they're not an eighth of an inch. And it turns out they had to swap their tip manufacturer because the first one went bust during the pandemic and they never checked that it was the right size. So fortunately they managed to go through their warehouse and they found one that was three times the price that still had the old size tip. So we got them to send that to us. We were super excited. We're ready to go. We get the instrument under the ramen. We're ready for our 24 hours of measurements. We've got Trader Joe's ready meals. We've got snacks. And just as we are pressurizing our cell, the pump generator breaks. And that has now gone off for repair. It's going to be another month until they can fix that for us. So overall, I would say building the lab has been just hindered massively by supply chain delays. Pretty much everything that arrives is outside of the manufacturing tolerances. And then prices just keep going up with inflation. So it is a very challenging time to build a lab. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Penny. Um, okay, so some follow-up questions for you. Is the depth of the earthquakes or the depth of the magma storage a more reliable indicator of eruption risk? Or do you have to assess both factors? 
That's a great question. So we've started testing this method at Kilauea where we have fantastic earthquake data already. And we've shown that our method matches that perfectly. But where we really want to apply this method is volcanoes where we don't have earthquake data. So the vast majority of volcanoes around the world are not monitored, or maybe they will have one seismometer. That is not enough to get magma storage depth. So when they start to wake up those volcanoes, people will go in and put temporary seismometers on them. But we really need to understand where the magma is stored before that happens. And we can do that by collecting rock samples in a way that we can't putting seismic networks out. So really, we've tested this on volcanoes to show they match, but we can apply this method in countries where they don't have the resources. Or even like Mount Shasta in Latin Peak in California, we don't have enough earthquakes to know the depth of magma storage from earthquakes there. So even in California, we don't have those constraints. Great. So there's a question um, from Barbara Sweet. What got you interested in, in this subject of volcanoes? Honestly, watching Dante's Peak, it's a movie with Pierce Brosnan. I would 100% recommend. I wanted to be a veterinarian <laughs> before that. So go watch Dante's Peak, folks. It's the best. <laughs> Great. Um, and so besides Kilauea, which volcanoes are you most interested in studying? Yeah, so I did my PhD in Kilauea. We've now started looking at Mauna Loa, um, which is should be as active as Kilauea over long amounts of time. It's been anomalously quiet for the last 30 years, but obviously it erupted this, this winter. So we're starting a project on that. Um, I have uh, a postdoc who's done some work on the Atlantic hotspots. So we're going to look at some of those as well. And then during my postdoc, I also worked on the Cascade volcanoes. So all the way up through Oregon, California, Washington. So they're my main research focus at the moment. Okay. Um, great. All right. Well, um, so I think it's time to move on. So our next speaker is James Nunez. So James is an assistant professor in the Molecular and Cell Biology Department, my department at UC Berkeley. He's a Hannah Gray Fellow of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and, in, and an investigator of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. Previously, he was a postdoctoral fellow with Jonathan Weissman at UCSF, and he earned his PhD at UC Berkeley in Jennifer Doudna's lab. He joined our faculty in 2021. The core interest of James' group is to um, understand the regulatory principles of the human genome. Specifically, the Nunez lab investigates the molecular principles underlying epigenetic memory and inheritance in mammalian cells. So basically how cells establish an epigenome to control gene expression programs and how this epigenome, which controls gene expression is maintained and remodeled as cells divide and differentiate and how defects in these um, pathways can lead to disease. So James, please tell us about your experiences as a new faculty member. Thank you, Rebecca, for that nice introduction. And thank you all for joining. So my, let me just, so my journey as Rebecca sort of alluded to actually started here at Berkeley. So I did my PhD in the department that I'm in, um, in Jennifer Doudna's lab. And I had no intention of doing any type of CRISPR related research when I started my PhD. But at the time we were just studying how bacteria sort of fight the viruses and the phages that infect them. Very, very uh, fundamental question. And I joined her lab about three months before her landmark paper came out that eventually won her the Nobel Prize. So it was really a wild ride to just see a really basic biology project or set of projects that have sort of transcended beyond um, Berkeley and into even areas outside of biomedical sciences. Um, and CRISPR really relies on this simplicity where we can go into the genomes of uh, mammals, humans, um, animals, plants, and we can make really precise changes to the human genome sequence in this example. And this really um, relies on the ability to cut DNA where we want. So if you have a, a genetic mutation where getting rid of that mutation is gonna cure your disease, we have ways to do that. However, many studies have sort of shown that just this act of cutting DNA is quite toxic. And in some of the more um, extreme cases, as people have been finding out in recent years, you can also get really large chunks of your genome um, of chromosomes being removed from your cells. So that, of course, could lead to cancer and other types of genomic instability. 
So sort of driven by these observations, um, I moved to do a postdoc in Jonathan Weissman's lab right across the bay where uh, my motivation was really to create new technologies to allow us to manipulate the production of genes without having to cut DNA. So really just making um, newer and safer ways to control how much of a gene is being produced. And we'd love to be able to do this for any human um, gene. So how do we do this? So a central focus of my lab is epigenetics. So this is a really complicated slide. So let me just walk you through this. So typically when we depict chromosomes in textbooks, um, you see this sort of chromosome, but if you start unraveling this chromosome into the actual letters of um, the bases that make up DNA, what we see is that we have these really small chemical marks uh, sometimes put on DNA. These are called epigenetic marks. And really the presence or absence of these marks can regulate whether a gene is being turned on or not. In a different day, I could talk to you about different types of epigenetics uh, pathways, how it's uh, involved in aging. But for the sake of this talk, um, what we really is, uh, what we're trying to do is really use the rules of epigenetics to be able to either turn off a gene or turn on a gene. And here with our technologies, what we do is we don't break DNA, but we have ways to really go into wherever we want in the human genome and change these really small chemical marks that allow us to control whether a gene is on or off. And we do this by uh, building a set of technologies. So these are called epigenetic editing technologies. The, here we use CRISPR not as a way to cut DNA, but we use it as a way to direct really proteins and enzymes that allow us to write all these different chemistry wherever we want in the genome. And to sort of depict an example data set of typically what we get in the lab is here where our goal here was to turn off a gene in human cells that we can grow in a dish in the lab, go into uh, all of these cells, turn off a gene using these epigenetic technologies, and we can see in this example, we let these cells sort of divide for 50 days, and the gene that we epigenetically repressed remains off during this whole process. And what's cool about this technology, again, is we um, did not cut DNA at all in order to turn off this gene. We didn't change the DNA sequence. It's all based on these little chemical marks. Um, so what sort of summarized the, the, this sort of um, area of research in my lab, it's really exciting because I like to think of them as sort of light switches. So if you have um, a gene that's causing a, a disease, we have these set of technologies that we can sort of go in and then just turn that light switch off. And we've done an experiment here, and I like to show this slide because it was a quite intricate experiment that we did where here our goal was to just show proof of concept experiments that we can go into neurons and turn off a gene that causes neurodegeneration. So this is a gene um, that's encoded by MAPT. Um, the protein product of this gene is called tau. And what we did here was we applied our epigenetic editing technologies in stem cells, where there we went into these cells and turned off this tau gene. We then um, convert these cells into neurons. We can do this in a dish, it's really cool. So this is an image here of the neurons where we edited this uh, uh, protein called tau. The neurons actually look very nice and look clean. And we can, what we can do is go into these neurons and really measure how much of this gene that causes neurodegeneration is actually being lowered with the technologies. And you can see here cells, each of these dots is actually a cell, it's a neuron. And each of these neurons in the box uh, suggests that we've successfully lowered the expression of this, of this gene. Um, this was cool because one, we can show sort of proof of concept that we can do these sort of intricate experiments. But as you can see, not all the cells are in this box. So it actually gives my lab quite a wealth of um, sort of a, a projects that allows us to improve on the technologies that we have. And how are we doing this? So I'll just highlight a couple of projects in the lab. Um, instead of just building one or two um, epigenetic editing technologies, what we're actually doing now is to invent hundreds of them all at the same time. So this is a project that is quite a big undertaking in my lab. It's um, headed by a graduate student. We're here, we're taking any protein that's involved in epigenetics um, from plants, from humans, from yeast, and we're directly testing them in human cells for their ability to edit epigenetic marks in cells. So this allows us to discover new epigenetic editing technologies that people haven't really tested before 
and also go back to our experimental sort of methods to see if we can improve on what we already have. And another project that I'd like to highlight is what are we actually doing with this technology? So a different graduate student in my lab who is jointly advised between me and um, Jennifer Doudna is we're taking our epigenetic editors and we're using really advances in mRNA therapeutics thanks to the COVID vaccines. And we're delivering these into immune cells that allow these immune cells to really combat cancer cells um, more efficiently. Um, and what we're doing here is we're turning off genes in these cells that prevent them from being exhausted. So a lot of times when T cells um, see an infection, they can fight those sort of infected cells, but they have a shelf life. They get tired and they're no longer effective. We know sort of the genes that allow us to turn them off using our marks that allow them to sort of get less tired over time and allow these cells to really fight those tumor cells um, longer. So that's sort of the science part. I'm really excited about some of these projects that we have going on in the lab. And I'll just sort of share a few things about my experience here at Berkeley. So I started a little bit different from Penny. So I took over uh, a lab space of a long time and very accomplished professor here in my department, um, Dr. Jeremy Thorner. And he's had his lab for many decades. And my story was that I started the day after he retired. So I actually took over a space that was still occupied heavily by equipment that's been there for many years, which was great because I got to inherit a lot of equipment. But at the same time, our research is very different. Um, so um, Dr. Thorner's research was more in yeast. Mine is in human cells. So I spent my first few months actually cleaning, literally cleaning um, every day. I had about 20 trash cans full of stuff. And um, I got to learn a lot about how a lab functions by getting rid of a lot of things that I didn't need. Um, but suffice it to say, my lab doesn't look like this. I wish I had a photo to show you what the post cleaning is. But what um, I've done is really built a really wonderful team of people, very diverse. They come from very different scientific backgrounds, um, educational backgrounds, and it's a really, really vibrant environment because we get ideas that I personally don't think of sometimes, and my students really bring in some of these really cool and neat ideas. And one of my favorite parts about Berkeley is that, um, and this is just photos of my lab, is that because it's a, a public university, I'm able to go into different departments and really get expertise on things that I am not an expert in. So for example, we deal with a lot of genomics data um, because we work on epigenetics and DNA. So I'm not a computational biologist, but I've been really lucky to just knock on the door of someone here, um, Dr. Sarah Chasens. She's in a different um, uh, department, but her expertise has really been um, incredibly helpful to just get my students and postdocs thinking about how to analyze big data, how to use computational and programming languages to really um, answer some of our really big, heavy questions. And within my department, I'm extremely lucky to have great colleagues, especially uh, assistant professors that have been hired in the past few years, and we have a really tight-knit group. Um, this is just an example of some of the picnics that we hold together. Um, and that is sort of been the experience that I've had in the past year and a half since I've been here of just really highly collaborative people and um, very warm and friendly and supportive. And with that, I will take questions. Okay, thank you, James. So one question is, what lessons did you learn as a graduate student with Jennifer Doudna that inform your approach as a professor of building a lab and recruiting students? Yeah, so um, Jennifer's lab was quite large. I joined her lab, you know, long after she started it. So I didn't get to learn how to start a lab from my time in her lab, unfortunately. Um, but what it did help me sort of uh, <clears throat> during my process is I've seen sort of just from observing how she runs a team um, that really helped me. So how to give people independence, letting them sort of think of their own ideas rather than me giving them ideas. And that's been really helpful in sort of building my team of just allowing my people to think creatively independent of me. Uh-huh. Okay, there's a, a question in the chat from Barbara Sweet. Um, so when you were speaking about uh, fighting cancer, was there any specific type of cancer that you could concentrate on? Yeah, I didn't sort of focus on this. So um, what the sort of therapies that we're working on are called CAR-T. 
So this is a um, set of technologies where you can engineer your own T cells that allow it to be put back into your cells to fight off your own tumors. So these are typically used currently for um, lymphomas and leukemias, but tons of work is being done on this to also go after solid tumors. The nice thing about these sort of engineered T cells is we can extract them out of patients, do a sort of editing experiments here in my lab, and then potentially put them back into those patients once we can sort of show proof of concept experiments that we've engineered them to fight these cancer cells better. Okay, and you think that um, epigenetic editing is really the key to making CRISPR therapies safer? Um, and yeah. Yeah, uh, so I- Could other techniques yeah. do this too? Yeah, absolutely. I definitely am supportive of other techniques. So I think what we're learning now in the field of CRISPR is that there isn't going to be one technology that's going to rule them all. It really will just depend on what sorts of things you want to edit. But what is sort of true is that cutting DNA has been pretty toxic. And I think many of us are thinking, even beyond epigenetics, you know, thinking of creative ways to sort of go after these problems without having to manipulate your DNA sequence. Great. Um, and personally, I'm interested um, also in, as I age in this sort of <laughs> dementia issue. And so you've shown how you can um, edit these stem cells. How could you actually apply um, your technology to treat people with Alzheimer's or other diseases? Like yeah, that? the key there is delivery. So, you know, we can build all these tools however we want, but a huge issue in sort of gene therapy is just delivery. And um, getting into the brain is probably one of the hardest um, places in the body to get it into. But um, we have the Innovative Genomics Institute here that sort of do these sort of brain specific types of delivery. And unfortunately, I didn't have time to talk about that, but we're working on some of those projects as well. Yeah, there's one more question in the chat from um, Julie Birch asking, um, how is this medicine happening now or is this future, work for future implementation? Yeah, so um, a company actually spun off of the work that I did as a postdoc. It's based in Boston. And that plus two or three other companies have sort of spun off in the past year to really use epigenetic editing as a way to sort of go after genetic diseases, again, without having to edit your DNA sequence. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, uh, James. I think we'll now move on to our final speaker, who is Eric Ma. So Eric is an assistant professor in the Department of Physics and Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Um, he joined our faculty in July of 2021 and currently holds the Georgia Lee Chair in Physics. The Ma Lab studies wave matter interaction in uncommon regimes and in the intersection between condensed matter physics and artificial intelligence. Eric was recently recognized for his work with the prestigious Amazon Physical Science Fellowship, which honors those working to bridge the gap between fundamental scientific results in the physical sciences and the development of important technologies. Tonight, Eric will be sharing his experience as a new member of the physics faculty. Eric, what would you like to share? Cool. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Rebecca. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Eric Ma, Assistant Professor in Physics and EECS. Uh, I joined Berkeley in 2021 after getting my PhD in postdoc at Stanford and a short tenure in Apple. Um, so I'm a condensed matter physicist. So what is condensed matter physics? Well, condensed matter physics studies the physics of liquids and solids. Um, so it, it centers around this idea of emergence or more is different. That is a fundamentally new phenomena would emerge if you put a lot of simple constituents together. And this can actually manifest at, across different uh, uh, lens and time scales from uh, crystals to multicellular organisms, flocking birds, human society, and the large uh, scale structure of the universe. And we are mostly interested in the, uh, uh, the emergence in the, uh, the micro and mesoscopic scale uh, using mostly you know, relatively simple inorganic constituents like atoms or nanostructures. Uh, we study the emergent electronic, magnetic, and optical properties, uh, quantum phenomena such as superconductivity, uh, as well as the effects of topology and uh, reduced dimensionalities. 
Um, so I actually consider myself a new member of, you know, a member of new uh, uh, group of Vulcanized Matter physicists who are not just focused on the holy grills like room temperature superconductivity, but would take a broader view of societal needs and are not afraid of uh, getting out of our comfort zone and think out of the box to come up with new ideas, often at the interface between fundamental and applied science. Um, and that is reflected in the breadth of the research topics in my group. Um, so my group currently pursues uh, two topics, two directions. One is wave matter interaction in uncommon regimes, and the other is the interface between physics and artificial intelligence. Uh, I'll just tell you three examples. So on the wave matter interaction side, which also is more experimental, we're trying to answer the question of, can vibrational modes in solids emit light? So um, there are electronic and vibrational modes uh, that are both extended uh, and localized. So you're probably very familiar with light emitted by the electronic transitions that are extended. Uh, for example, in semiconductors, these would be the basis of LEDs, semiconductor lasers, for example. Uh, you're probably also heard of uh, light emitted by the electronic transitions that are localized in atoms or molecules, such as these biomarkers. Um, and, and the atoms. Um, so localized vibrational modes can also emit light. For example, that's the basis of the carbon dioxide laser that is used in many industrial uh, and medical procedures. So now the questions, what about the extended vibrational states in solids, i.e. the optical phonons? Um, so based on some recent progress that we made, uh, we think the answer is yes, as long as we use the right materials under the right excitation conditions. So on the physics and AI side, so this is more theoretical, we're trying to answer the question of how can we make large language models like uh, GPT and POM more useful for physics researchers. Um, so these, um, uh, these large language models or LLMs can already do amazing things, but somehow there, there are a few key pain points. Uh, for example, they don't process complex equations or figure plots or even references very well. So we're trying to figure out how we can solve these key points and then make them uh, tremendously seem more useful for the physics researchers and can extend to other quantitative fields. And then somewhere in between, uh, we're trying to answer the question of, uh, can we have one framework to inverse design devices uh, for all kinds of wave matter interactions, including photonics, acoustics, and even quantum? So inverse design is this uh, computer algorithm that uses numerical simulations and, and optimization algorithms to, to design um, unintuitive devices uh, with uh, you know, much better uh, performance and robustness than these intuition design, uh, than designs based on intuition. Uh, and then we, we think the answer is yes. So, you know, as long as we use a physics agnostic engine like transfer matrix. So, for example, uh, this is pretty much, you know, the first uh, adjoint based inverse design of acoustics. So here we're trying to design a new kind of concrete blocks for highway sound barriers. So this thing is about 0.5 meters thick. Um, and then just, you know, the inverse design gave us these uh, un unintuitive places where we, we, we would place air gaps. And if you look at the transmission, this structure is many orders of magnitude better uh, than, this, uh, than a solid block uh, for these particular you know, highway noise uh, weighted by the human hearing uh, sensitivity. Okay, so, so that's the science we're doing in our lab. Um, so why Berkeley, right? So that's a simple one, because uh, Berkeley is the number one public university in the world, especially research-wise. It also has one of the world's uh, strongest condensed matter physics program. Uh, the uh, EECS also happens to be, you know, one of the world's best. Uh, and then you, Berkeley physics also has a unique advantage, uh, that is its proximity to the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, the LBNL, which is one of the largest and most productive national labs in the country. Uh, so my lab is literally a 10 minute shuttle drive away from, uh, from LBNL. And as a faculty scientist, I can tap into uh, the facility level uh, resources there to carry out projects that are not possible elsewhere. And, and finally, uh, it's the Bay Area. You know, I really like the weather here. Uh, it's really hard to move after staying here for 12 years. Uh, and I also really like the, uh, the tech startup culture here. Um, so I think it'll be really beneficial when it comes to transforming the scientific breakthrough in my lab 
into technology that can impact society. Uh, and to that end, Berkeley is one of the, the best universities for startup founders. Uh, and I really look forward to seeing some of my students and postdocs joining the, uh, the founder crowd. Okay, so my experience as a new faculty. So first of all, I just wanna say that um, all my colleagues and staff in the department and the college have been super supportive and friendly. Uh, you know, when I first came here, I thought, you know, well, okay, as a tenure track assistant professor, I probably here. Uh, to be judged and potentially weeded out, but that couldn't be further away from truth. You know, everybody really wanted me to su succeed. Uh, but you know, as, as Steve mentioned, starting an experimental lab in the middle of a pandemic is, is not easy. Uh, for example, my lab renovation has been quite a journey. Uh, so the design actually started almost one year before my startup date. And after lots of iterations, we generated more than 50 pages of complex design like that. Uh, so we went to bid, and then to our surprise, even the lowest bid was more than 30% more expensive than our estimate. So it's a bit of a sticker shock. Uh, so after a lot of scrambling, change orders, and then the construction started, uh, you know, the, the physical construction part went really relatively smoothly, but it was pretty obvious from early on that we we're going to miss the original plan completion date, and that's September 2021. And then it turns out there are a lot of issues with cabinets, uh, countertops, HVACs, uh, and then the, the main lab was finally, uh, finally commissioned uh, in January of, of, of this year. Uh, but it's not all, all, uh, all bad. Um, you know, while waiting for the lab to, uh, to, to be finished, uh, you know, I couldn't do state-of-the-art experiments, so I started to do some theory and modeling, and we actually had to uh, publish two decent papers on that and it's good to know that I can still do theory. Um, so uh, especially at the early stages of starting up, I, I felt like you know, I was working as a one man startup. Uh, so I was doing anything from you know fixing the blinds and putting together IKEA furniture for a student office and then making you know, tons and tons of purchases with a price tag that ranges from one dollar to hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and then have to make the group web website all by myself. So that's it's a lot of hard work, but I, I really like the, um, uh, the final results. So um, and last but not least, I found teaching to be very fun. You know, I really enjoyed interacting with the uh, undergrad students, uh, the TAs, and my fellow co-instructors in the classroom setting. Okay, so what's my new daily routine? Well, I, these days I spend most of my time writing grants with a hundred Chrome tabs open, uh, just to have enough resources to sustain a group of critical mass, especially in light of the recent increases in uh, the GSR and postdoc salaries. Um, I, I hope I can uh, succeed in that front, and then uh, I really look forward to getting more science done with the team uh, at Cal for many years to come. Yeah, that's that's all. Thank you, Eric. Um, so, one question is. What project do you have that you think is closest to being commercialized if it's successful, like the barriers along highways to reduce highway noise, or what do you think is, is closest? Yeah, so, so I think the physics agnostic inverse design has a lot of potentials. Uh, you know, that barrier for highways, it's really many orders of magnitude um, uh, better than just a concrete block, but it is more uh, costly and more complex to manufacture. So. I think it's one of the closest to commercialization, but in this market, we still need to weigh like, okay, is, the, is this really worth it? Uh, and then it can actually lead to many other things, like uh, I didn't mention this, but we're working on using inverse design, the like multi-physics inverse design, uh, to, uh, to develop a new way to do thermal imaging using optical up conversion. So, you know, that's another, that's a way, another project I think is pretty close to commercialization if the initial prototypes are successful. Great. So there's a question in the chat from Edwin Munsey asking, what did the lab renovation cost? Oh, wow. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, uh, but it's uh, millions of dollars. Wow. Yeah. And he has another question. Can you comment on the quality of the students, both undergraduate and graduate? Yeah, so I really liked interacting with the undergraduate students. Um, so, you know, there's, they're, they're, they're very diverse, they're from many different backgrounds, and they're all really motivated to get into research, you know, no matter how small of a research project or idea I give them, 
you know, I, I heard these horror stories from my colleagues uh, that are in these elite private universities where the undergrads would treat undergrad research as sort of a given thing that's a service to them. I, I couldn't feel any of that in at Berkeley. Um, no. Great. Um, okay, so yeah, and what do you, you know, after this difficult renovation, um, what is the most important thing that you've learned? Okay, so triple check everything because change orders are extremely expensive. <laughs> okay, um, and then one more question. Uh, what is the potential practical application of studying light emission from vibrations in solids? Yeah, so this could just be another, uh, an alternative source for mid-infrared light. Uh, we can possibly make uh, more compact mid infrared lasers for you know medical procedures or range finding uh, or uh, you know long distance chemical analysis. So yes, yeah, so that's just one one way to do that. And of course, if we have this additional light source in the mid infrared, we can also do uh, mid infrared quantum optics. You know that's related to quantum networking and quantum communications. Uh -huh. Okay, and one more question came into the chat. Do you make use of the physics department's um, lab equipment manufacturing capability? So do you manufacture things in the- Oh, yes, yeah, instrumentation, yeah. So to do these state-of-the-art experiments on the wave matter interaction side, we we pretty much make make all of, most of our, our instruments. Yeah, instrumentation is, is really big. Yeah, lots of machining, designing, PCBs, and, and optics. Wonderful. Okay, um, so I think that's all the questions specifically for you, Eric. I want to thank you, James and Penny, for sharing your experiences as, as new faculty members with us. And I'm going to invite the three of you back to answer some questions from the audience. Uh, so please feel free to add any more questions that you have to the chat. Um, and I see one here, whoops. Um, so, so this was actually for James. And actually, maybe you could um, talk to Eric about this, but do you use any forms of artificial intelligence to analyze the data that you generate? This is from Doug Smith. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are just launching that project now. So I'm not an AI person, but there's a lot of push in genomics to use deep learning and neural networks. and because my data, we generate a lot of these um, data sets. We're working with a professor, Sarah Chasens. So she has a PhD student working on this actively. So I wish I could tell you more about the details, but um, you know, we're just about to launch that. Okay. Um, yeah, so we've heard from, from Eric about his teaching, but um, do Penny or James want to comment on your experiences with teaching undergraduates or involving them in research? Yeah, I can go quickly. So I taught um, an environmental science class uh, this semester. So it's an intro class for non-geologists. And it was, they were so engaged. Like we learned a lot about like environmental justice and like how it affects Oakland and the Central Valley and so many students. I was just, yeah, blown away how much they cared about the planet and the kind of challenges that their generation are going to face. So it was really, really rewarding teaching that class. And a lot of people would always come up after lectures and want to talk about what, you know, happened in their communities back home. So yeah, that was super fun. And I've got two wonderful undergraduates working in the lab this semester who are super keen. So yeah, it's been great to work with them. Yeah, similar story. Um, so I taught a small class at Berkeley last semester that was 130 students. Um, it was a molecular biology course, and I was pleasantly surprised just how engaged they were, especially coming from, you know, COVID Zoom days and then going into in-person. Um, the number of questions I was getting during my lectures was just incredible. And I have four undergraduates in my lab. I wish I could take more because they're all so good, but it's maxed out by physical space. Yeah. Okay, um, Penny, <clears throat> there's one more specific question for you. What are the odds of Mauna Loa having a major eruption, like hitting Hilo, for example? And there's oh. a Richard Reader <laughs> asked this question and he has a personal interest. 
do be pretty careful with answers like this. On average, Mauna Loa has erupted every five years. So some of those eruptions are confined to the summit where they don't cause much damage or like the one this uh, winter where it almost made it to the saddle road but didn't. But yeah, if you look at a geological map of Mount Loa over 100, 200 years, a lot do go down there. So I wouldn't say I wouldn't buy a house there, but it, it's, it is scary that it could happen. And Kona is the scarier one. With Hilo, you have a shallow slope, so you'll have like days before the lava flow gets to you. Kona, the Kona coast, lava flows could reach the coast within three hours of the eruption starting. Yeah. So if that happened in the middle of the night, that would be evacuating everyone in the dark within three hours of the lava appearing at the summit. So that is, I would be more scared on the Kona coast. Hilo, you'll have some warning to get out. Well, all right. Um, so now another question for all three of you. What has been the most challenging and the most rewarding aspect of your first years as a Berkeley faculty member? And I'm curious, I'm really curious to hear what you have to say. As a department co-chair, we really want to try to facilitate your success. So it's good to know what your challenges are and also to know what's working. I can probably start. Um, I think the most challenging is learning what to prioritize on at any given time. You know, I, at the start of my life, I sort of spent most of my time just try to get the lab in order, just order stuff, uh, negotiating with vendors for the lowest price. But later I was told, well, you shouldn't be, you know, wasting all that time. You should spend more time writing grants. Uh, and now I'm sort of switching back, okay, writing the grants, and I don't have time for research. Like, you know, how do we, how do we balance this? Uh, it's, I think it's still something I'm still learning. So yeah, I think that's that's very challenging. If if there's you know uh, more mentor or you know, hand holding in that process, that'll be super helpful. Yeah. Penny, um, money. My field is chronically underfunded. NSF haven't increased their budgets in ten years for petrology and volcanology, and honestly, don't know how I'm going to afford more than one mm. student. Inflation with my startup, which was negotiated in 2020, is a huge struggle. So yeah, if anyone wants to give millions of dollars to volcanology, that would be wonderful. That's what we need. <laughs> yeah, I would sort of echo some of the tidbits from the other talks. Um, I think the beginning is just hard because you're a one person startup and you know dealing with the vendors, having to set up the lab physically, and transitioning from you know a fully functioning scientist from a postdoc to now thinking about money and grants and mentoring and teaching and then getting your science up and running that you know should be your main priority but you're sort of spread very thin it's gotten easier i would say but you know just learning how to put out little fires is mm -hmm. probably going to be a constant uh challenge and what were the unexpected rewards of starting a new lab? You already mentioned, James, the, you know, the interaction with your lab members and seeing them grow as scientists is, I, for me, that was a really huge thing. Um, what else um, comes to mind? Yeah, I, I can just go off of that. So I think it's things that, cannot be put on a CV or can't be quantified. It's, you know, when your students and postdocs get a really great result, you know? So just the sort of daily joys, the ups and downs. And for example, one of my students won a prestigious NSF graduate fellowship today. And that's a huge win for my lab because of money issues, but also, you know, it's a direct result of our work on him. So it's those things that I think really what makes it all worth it. Mm -hmm. No one's mentioned food. Any Bay Area food is great. Close to campus. Well, it's not too surprising, but you know, the housing prices. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, that's another big challenge. So there is a question in the chat. Is there any institution or organization you wish to move it to besides Berkeley? So are you satisfied here? Do you feel like you have a good future here or is this just a temporary place? 
I would say it is hard to compare yourself to institutions where they get two or three graduate students a year funded, like Stanford, for example. That definitely feels like, how am I supposed to do that with the resources I have at the moment? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I love I love the politics in California. It would be much cheaper if I went somewhere else in the US. I'd be able to have more graduate students, but that's not a, a balance mm -hmm. I'm willing to make. So the high cost of living here is because it's nice here. So that's the toss up. Yes. Yeah, I think um, I have friends at different institutions, the Harvards and the Stanfords of the world, and I think they complain about different things. So what I've learned is sort of whichever institution you are, you have your own set of challenges. So it's hard for me to say that this is temporary because I'm pretty happy here. So I had many options to go elsewhere, but you know I'm pretty satisfied with my decision. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so there, are, we're getting some suggestions in the chat uh, to Penny to create a donation page for your lab and um, a mailing list. And, you know, there is the big give once a year. And really, you know, this is a um, one of the questions is, you know, can philanthropy or other funding sources help close this gap? Because we know you're under we're all under pressure to um, get funding. It would be amazing if we could have like a GoFundMe competition between. <laughs> oh, um, so there's a question from Catherine Shu. My son, who's 10, wants to know if Eric Ma or anyone else is a fan of um, Kurt Skazakt. Yes, I'm a fan. I mean, that poster is from them. I have their posters okay. all over my student office. Big fan. Okay, and do you do any of you have comments? And Edward Ching is wondering if you had any comments for the alumni in the audience, the Berkeley alumni. Go Bears. <laughs> okay, um, great. Well, it's been such a pleasure to hear about your research. Um, and now to close, I'm going to hand the floor over to de the Dean of Biological Sciences, Mike Botchin. Mike, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Rebecca. And uh, thanks everybody for the hard work they put into this presentation. And it's, it's really exciting to, to, to see new projects and just echoing something Steve said at the beginning, teaching uh, is, is, is such a, a, an optimistic thing. And I think it's it 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 it's points out how uh, how recruiting assistant professors to Cal and having them interact with each other is so important to our culture here. Uh, and I I I want to thank uh, 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 Penny and and James and and Eric for uh, the work they put into this. And I, I I think it's important for us to focus on the fact that. So many of our, our assistant professors who are actually in different parts of our uh, campus ecosystem share similar problems. And it's Im important for, for me, and I think uh, people like Steve and Rebecca who have administrative responsibilities to realize that we're not alone in dealing with uh, helping assistant professors sort of uh, manage uh, a difficult, difficult uh, part of their careers that, in fact, uh, generally turn out spectacularly well. And that's why, in fact, I think the answer to the question of is, are there any other places that would be better? In the end, uh, I don't think there are. I think that Berkeley is the place to be. Okay, with that, having said all that, uh, I want to uh, tell our audience that that uh, we're having another one of these events coming soon. Uh, the next installment of this uh, Basic Science Lights the Way, I'm just going to read this, is, is a week from today. Okay, I wanted to get that correct. And it'll uh, cover applied mathematics, uh, something that I think many of us are interested in as hobbies, but we're going to have professionals, three faculty members from the Department of Mathematics, about how how to combine mathematical science with specialized knowledge to further advances in a variety of fields. 
Okay, so uh, in closing, let me uh, remind the audience that we're, we're doing this for you. And I'm sure that many of you will have questions or uh, in the future, and you shouldn't hesitate to, uh, uh, to get in touch with us and uh, write to uh, any, any of us who are on this, uh, on this line. And the, the, the event itself will be uh, uh, in, in a video that you can always watch. And the other videos for the other events, and we've done uh, many of these so far, uh, they're all, uh, I think, uh, they're all spectacular. Uh, so uh, just keep in touch. And, uh, you know, I think just uh, I, Penny said, you know, it would be great to have a lot more money if, if any of you are interested in helping Penny uh, or, or any of, any of the, our assistant professors here. You're more than welcome to do that. Okay. So uh, thank you again for kicking off this semester with us. Uh, and uh, uh, as Rebecca said, go Bears. And of course, Fiat Lux, which is really close to our heart. Let there be light. Bye. <laughs>